Good morning, everybody. I, I hope you can hear, you, hear me. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Killian Clifford, and I am the uh, moderator for today's session. Now, I'm just going to try and share my screen here with you. Um, so welcome, everybody, uh, to the Diaspora uh, Summit here in Dublin, or virtually, as we are all joining it. My name is Killian Clifford. And I am uh, the host for today's session. Now, we have today, so I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen because it's not working with. We have today a session on um, if, uh, uh, the diaspora philanthropy called Time, Talent and Treasure. So philanthropy is often defined as private contributions for, for public good. And we see it most obviously with large entities such as uh, say, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation or the Open Society Foundation, but philanthropy is more than just the provision of financial resources. It's about the three T's of time, talent, and treasure. And here, diasporas have a rich history in philanthropy, whether it might be through mentoring, which is time, skills transfer, which is talent, or indeed financial support, which is treasure. And through philanthropy, diasporas become important actors in sustainable development, whether it might be at home or abroad. So today's session will examine this role more closely and explore some of the key trends and models for success. Uh, and from these learnings, actionable takeaways for key stakeholders in the area of the aspect philanthropy uh, will be provided. And the output from this session will feed into the output document for the summit, which is known as the future agenda document. And to facilitate that, we have a action packed agenda. In a moment, I'll be handing over to the session host Kingsley Aiken uh, of the Networking Institute. Uh, then we'll have a TED Talk video from Almaz Nagash of the African Diaspora Network. And we'll also hear from Jan Sanjeev uh, Josipura of In Diaspora, followed by an interactive session where we invite insights from you, the attendees, based on questions we will be sharing. Some brief housekeeping. Um, I think everyone's been working on Zoom for the last two years, so everyone probably well familiar with this, but the session will be recorded. Um, just to say, microphones will be muted except for speakers. Uh, and we'll ask speakers to closely adhere to the time limit. So I guess most importantly, translation is available through the globe function at the bottom of, of Zoom there. You can see it, the little globe, and we'll have translation in one of the six official UN languages. And next to that, we have chat functions if you want to uh, comment on anything that the speakers are saying or indeed add any questions. And um, we'll be monitoring those questions. And later on through the interactive discussion, you have the opportunity to, to um, uh, raise your hand and, and uh, ask questions verbally uh, or even speak or intervene verbally. Okay, so with no further ado, let me hand over to Kingsley Aiken of the Networking Institute. And Kingsley, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Killian, and good morning, everybody. And thank you to IOM and to the Irish government for hosting this uh, really important and I think innovative event here today. Uh, my background is I worked for uh, 17 years running a diaspora philanthropy organization um, based out of the United States, but eventually all around the world. Um, I have to admit and say that the first event of this organization uh, in New York with the great, the good uh, came to this event. The event was so unsuccessful that the only reason we had a second event a year later was to pay for the first event. Well, that's nearly $700 million ago. So I'm a great believer that uh, you've got to start small on these things and the potential can be extraordinary. That money was raised at no cost to the to taxpayers or to, or to government. And you heard the definition there from Killian about philanthropy, um, time, treasure, talent, the kindness of strangers, you know, private contributions for public good. Um, I quite like the definition of planting trees under whose shade you will not sit. I think that's a kind of a nice definition of philanthropy. And in a sense, society is a stool with three legs. You need a profitable business sector. You need an efficient government sector. But you also need an effective NGO or, or third sector. And philanthropy has deep historical and, uh, and indeed religious roots. But what's exciting about this period now is I think we're going to enter into an a period of extraordinary, potentially explosive growth in the whole area of diaspora philanthropy. Now, one of the drivers of this is what we call the intergenerational transfer of wealth. The greatest cash of money in the history of mankind is actually now in the hands of people aged 60 and over. And they have to figure out 
what they're going to do with it. There's a great report written by Accenture some time ago called The Greater Wealth Transfer. It said that in the United States alone, $30 trillion is going to be transferred intergenerationally in the, between now and the year 2050. So there's great potential for diasporas to be part of that. And when you think about this wealth that is in the hands of in, individuals, uh, where was it, where is it going to go when it's distributed intergenerationally? Well, it's going to go three places. It's going to go firstly to kids, to heirs, to children. They're going to inherit lots and lots of money. That's just the story of life. Um, secondly, it could go to governments through taxation systems. And thirdly, it's going to be given away, given away philanthropically. We sometimes say that life is about going from struggle to success and from success to significance. And it's in that period when people begin to reflect on their legacy, their mark in their sand, and often on their heritage. So there's a distinct diaspora advantage and a diaspora angle to all of this. And structures are now being developed uh, to facilitate this kind of transfer of wealth. You know, community foundations is a phenomenon which actually started way back in 1914 in Cleveland in the United States, but they've spread throughout the world. There are now over 2,000 community foundations in 70 countries around the world. But also new structures have emerged, in particular what we call donor-advised funds uh, within the banking system. You know, last year in the United States of 501c3s, which is the ruling in the tax laws defining a public charity, the number one in the United States last year was Fidelity Bank, who have set up this structure of donor-advised funds, allowing individuals to make contributions or to put money into the banking system, get a tax deduction, and then to distribute that money to projects, philanthropic projects that they like. And many of these can be overseas or back in their country of heritage. There are now over a million donor-advised funds in the US. There's 180 billion in assets. Last year, they gave out 37 billion uh, to charitable organizations. Um, and this year alone, Americans will send over $200 billion overseas uh, to projects outside of the United States. So that's a kind of a fascinating thing. So diaspora philanthropy now is becoming a key part of what we call diaspora capital, the resources available to countries, cities, regions, locations, and places. And it's made up of three flows, flows of people, flows of knowledge, and flows of money. So having worked for you know so long in that in that organization with working with the with the Ireland funds, I, I kind of learned you know a series of key lessons about key kind of facts of life, if you like, if you like, about diaspora philanthropy. First is that you know money is the oxygen of our organizations, and you can only raise money from people who have it. Um, so that was a kind of a brutal sort of fact of life. And secondly, people give to people that they like and trust. That's the old Dale Carnegie line. People do business with people they like and trust. And, you know, in general, strangers don't give. So, so what we're really saying is that there's a bit of process in all of this. And diaspora philanthropy is not given. Uh, philanthropy has to be raised. It's not offered. It has to be asked for. And asking is your most powerful tool which you have in your diaspora philanthropy armory. And the final lesson is that diaspora philanthropy is not raised at your desk. You know, it just doesn't happen. You actually have to make it happen. And there's an interesting existing model, I think, out there, which, um, which can be very uh, helpful for developing diaspora philanthropy. And that's the United States and all university, the university alumni model, which really has two dimensions to it. The first dimension is raising money from a large number of people, but small contributions from a large number of people. And then there's raising large amounts of money from a small number of people. Um, and what's driven that whole industry at the university level is what we call campaign fundraising. And the campaign fundraising is deciding to raise a specific amount of money for a specific cause over a specific period of time. And there's a very precise process that we used in all our years working in diaspora philanthropy. And that was actually about four phases. It was about research. Research is finding the answers to that question about your diaspora. Who are they? Where are they? And what are they doing? 
and in a previous session this morning, we talked a lot about data uh, and the importance of knowledge and information and statistics and data. So the research side is not only finding out what somebody could do, but what they would do. In other words, you need to find out about their capacity and you need to find out about their propensity. Um, they may have terrific capacity, but no interest in the projects which you have in your diaspora or back in your home country. And the second phase of this program is about cultivation. It's about taking people on a journey of ignorance of you and your organization and the, and the projects you want to support to a position of passionate zealotry. And that takes time, it takes energy, it takes empathy, it takes building friendships, building relationships, all of that stuff takes a lot of time. And then the third phase is solicitation. It's asking, as I said earlier, the most powerful marketing tool you have is the ability to ask. And it's extraordinary the number of people who are loath to ask, to even assume that people know what you want. So becoming a, a good solicitor, a good asker is a key skill in diaspora philanthropy. And then the third phase is what we call stewardship, which is after somebody's made a commitment to you. It's ensuring that you look after them, you explain to them, you reward and recognize people for their contributions. You show them the differences that have been made and you, you take every gift that they make as a down payment on the next gift because there's a life cycle of giving. And the number one reason somebody stops supporting diaspora philanthropy is because they detect a spirit of indifference. In some sense, their support, their financial support has been taken for granted. And there's a whole process in, in what we call campaign fundraising, which is about feasibility studies. It's about developing case statements. It's about building your donor pyramids. So there's a wonderful, very well-trodden path to follow to do this sort of stuff. It just finished with one story is that, you know, many years ago, there was a president of an Irish university on a flight in the United States was sitting beside a man, they started having a conversation. It turned out this man was actually a member of the Irish diaspora. He was Irish American. Uh, he'd been very successful in business. He'd never been to Ireland. The university professor invited him. He started to come regularly. He started to support projects in Ireland. He started to give and give and give, particularly to the university sector. He gave over a billion US dollars to universities in Ireland. We would not be where we are today without this man. His name is Chuck Feeney. Uh, he was a famous individual in the United States. Bill Gates and, and Warren Buffett say that Chuck Feeney is their hero. And what he did as a diaspora philanthropy was truly, truly remarkable. He was a disciple of Andrew Carnegie, the great Scottish philanthropist, who believed in give while you live. He said, he who dies thus rich dies disgraced. So this notion of a, a limited life foundation, Chuck Feeney decided to give all his money away, an extraordinary individual. He's still uh, uh, in, alive in uh, San Francisco now. He's retired. He's completely given away all his money. He lives in a rented apartment. Um, and he is, if you like, one of the great poster children for the potential that now exists for diaspora philanthropy. So, Killian, I've done my time there and I'll pass back to you. Thank, thank you, Kingsley, and uh, thank you for that anecdote on, on Chuck Feeney. I wasn't aware of, but San, Sanjeev very much is. Um, I, I think you raised some important points, really, uh, on the importance of engagement with philanthropy. You know, as you say, philanthropy it has to be raised, it has to be asked for, but it's not just about engaging at the beginning and taking it and running it away, but as you say, it's a life cycle of giving. So engaging before, engaging after are kind of key messages, I guess, from, from the whole summit, really, and, and how we do that on, on different levels for different types of uh, uh, diaspora engagement. Um, okay, so next up, we have a TED Talk session um, from Almaz Nagash of the African Diaspora Network. And I will ask my technical colleagues in the background if they could start to share that video. Hi, I am Alma Zunikashu with the African Diaspora Network. We are based in Santa Clara, California. So greetings from California to all of you who are participating at this conference on diaspora, whether in person or virtually. I just wanted to wish you the very best um, opportunity to connect, to learn, and to 
um, support each other. Uh, again, I am uh, delighted and uh, grateful to the friendship with Lara from IOM, Kingsley and Martin, great friends, all of you, and I thank you for the partnership and the friendship. I was asked to just briefly share the journey that brought me to start the African Diaspora Network, so I thought I'd share that with you uh, in the best way I know how within 10 minutes. Um, I think the, the program, the organization started just like everything else as an idea um, uh, and, and a, a need to try to bring Africans and friends of Africa together. Because you see, when we want to support communities around the world, whether it's uh, countries in Africa or other places, uh, even in our own community, you want to include the community that you're talking about. So I so avoid um, in the voices of the diaspora when wonderful uh, and uh, well-meaning um, American uh, social entrepreneurs were trying to do good things in the continent. I am originally from Eritrea. I was born and raised in Asmara. When then moved to uh, the Netherlands in 1984, I have a brother there, so I left Eritrea because of the war between Ethiopia and Eritrea, and so I moved uh, to the Netherlands after high school. So I stayed there for three and a half years and didn't really uh, do very well. Was, uh, the language was uh, just holding me back, and I was so impatient. I wanted to finish uh, college quickly. I, I had a chance to come to the U.S., and that has been fantastic. Since 1987, I've been uh, in the United States, and my life has been absolutely beautiful. With all its challenges as, a, as an immigrant, it has been very, very beautiful. And so I think that sense of beauty and challenge on all of the complexity that I felt when I was trying to uh, make ends meet too while I was a, a foreign student, uh, was that I saw this wonderful generosity of others who don't look like me, and they happen to be Americans, that I have considered them like family who made all things possible for me in the United States. That sense of um, comfort is probably what really started ADN. I knew that if we were able to create a space where Africans and friends of Africa can come together, change can happen. We can co-create, we can co-imagine possibilities for Africans and for non-Africans, especially for those who live in our community, for the communities in which we live. It's not one or the other. As you know, the diaspora is actually an extension of uh, the communities where we live too. So in order for me to do good for my family, I must be doing well in my community. Otherwise, remittances will not be able to go other kind of support, even the intellectual support that we give back to our uh, uh, home countries or any country in Africa would not probably be possible. So I'm very grateful for the opportunity that I had early on that also really propelled me to ask questions, ask why is the diaspora not at the table? So in, nine, in 2010, we started the African Diaspora Network and one person at a time it took five years to get it to a level where we can get some attention. And I'm very happy to say in 2016, we got a seed funding from the US State Department and we were able to uh, begin the first program of ADN, the African Diaspora Investment Symposium. We wanted to test whether our idea and those who supported me, a lot of the board members, the volunteers, whether our idea is really workable. Is it something that we can prove that Africans and non-Africans can work? And I can tell you today that yes, it is possible because the African Diaspora Network, the first program that we started in 2016 is celebrating, is convening the seventh African Diaspora Investment Symposium. And then out of that, we developed another three programs in one initiative. This cannot be possible in a vacuum. We were able to see need in Africa, what does symposium mean to those entrepreneurs in Africa that are in need of financial support, mentoring. Mentoring is key because we can't do everything alone. But when we have someone that we can count on, we do have the opportunity to do better. So mentoring, financing, uh, uh, access to financing and, and uh, 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 learning, training is very critical. So we started the Africa, the builders of Africa's future, 
We have 42 in the pipeline and we're just about to, nominate, to announce the nomination of the 10 to 12 or 10 to 13 entrepreneurs for the 2022 um, uh, Builders of Africa's Future Fellows. Out of that too, in 2020, when people saw this incredible energy that we had at the in-person convening, the last in-person convening in Silicon Valley, we were asked, do we have a similar program for Africans and diasporans in the United States? And this question came from a very mighty organization, the Silicon Foundation, the Silicon Valley Community Foundation. And I said, you know, it's my big boss, sure, we can do it if you can give us that money. And we got the seed funding that also helped us to develop Accelerating Black Leadership and Entrepreneurship Program. This is the latest program that really focuses on the need and providing access, training, access to funders and to mentors for Black African-Americans, the historical diaspora, and then like people like myself, the contemporary diaspora. As you know, Africa is large, huge. We're not just Africans in Africa or Africans, those like myself, who left home probably in the last, I don't know, uh, 56 years. We're talking about those who came probably about 400 years ago uh, out of, uh, you know, as uh, slaves to the United States who paved the way for many of us to be where we are. So I really believe personally, I am walking on their shoulders. And so there is a responsibility to give back. And I feel very fortunate that ADN will actually use our platform not only to bring uh, Africans and non-Africans, but also to build the bridge between the historical and the contemporary diaspora. So that's one last, um, one of the latest uh, programs that we have. And of course, we have an all year long convening. Uh, it's called Impact and Innovation Forums. We do this in San Francisco and in, in California, also in uh, Washington and New York in person in the past, but uh, we will start to do that hopefully this year. Uh, that we are not in, in COVID. So that's, those are the kind of programs that we're running. And then we have one initiative that's uh, related to healthcare, um, the telehealth the pilot news. project, it funded by uh, uh, the uh, Melinda and Bill Gates Foundation. And so we're very, very delighted for that opportunity. This is an ongoing thing. I encourage you to go look at our website. Um, but why is this important? What is this necessity of really getting diaspora engaged? Well, I'll say, why not? The reason is because you are, uh, this, this convening is happening in Ireland, the most wonderful, wonderful diasporans that we know of are the English diasporans. We have the Jewish diaspora. We've got so many. We've got the Asian diasporans, depending in which country you look in, the Filipino diaspora, the, the Latino diaspora, this huge dynamic diaspora that really has deep connection to their heritage, to their home country, that then go back and contribute, whether it's their talent, their time, or their treasure. So that connectedness is so critical. But for Africa, with 55 countries, it's even much more important. It's also way, way more complex. I always said that we really are one in so many ways. So what would it look like if we can continue to change the narrative of the continent in the way in which people see it, then maybe we can peel off the assumptions of the, country, of the continent. One assumption um, is that my, uh, Africans migrate out of uh, uh, Africa. No, it's not true. Actually, Africans migrate within Africa. Probably between 70 and 80% of migration happens into Africa. Some of us get out of the, the country, uh, the, the countries where we come from, based, uh, it could be political, it could be educational, it could be other things. We, there's so many reasons we get out. But there's one thing that connects us. Again, it's over and over and over. Our family, our friends, our heritage. We go back. And what do we do? We give back. We give back in the form of remittances. And I think it's wonderful that we give remittances. I do believe in giving and supporting your family. That will continue because it has been there for generations and it will not stop. And the question always is, what would it look like if we, the, the, the diaspora, can tap into our saving. Remember, we save money. $55 billion per year is saved by diasporas in the United States. So what would it look like if I and uh, others can take a little bit of that invest, that, uh, that savings and then invest it, invest it in a, in a, in a platform that is going to, in a, in a portfolio 
um, of opportunities that could then help communities in Africa. I think that should be the discussion moving on on diaspora. Individually as diasporans, what would it look like if we can try to begin to think about creating a sustainable mode of funding for our families, that would be wonderful if it's possible, but also generally trying to invest in communities where our families live or where our friends live, it doesn't matter which country, but the money that I possibly can give or invest in um, could actually make a difference in the continent. I know you will hear about this uh, because um, I was at the, uh, uh, two weeks ago, I was in Dubai to uh, participate in a small convening from Europe, from the United States to discuss about how the, uh, what the African Union is doing to ensure that these kind of financing platforms are available. You can hear this um, at the convening. I know that because there are a few people speaking on Friday where I will also be virtually on a panel to discuss what the African Union is doing. Please listen to that and let's see if there is a way we can all work together and support that platform. The Africa Diaspora Network is what it is today because of the partnership that we've formed. And those partnerships continue to fund us, to enable us. And I'm so grateful for those who believed in who we are, what we do, who we bring, my team, our board for making this possible. And special shout out to Martin Russell, who has always been my sounding board. I thank you. And this is the journey. The journey continues. I'm going to say this. It never stops. It's just one step at a time, but it continues. And I look forward to partnering with the with the with IOM, uh, with the, all of you to make sure those of you interested in working with the continent to do the best we can to bring people together. Because at the end of the day, I do like to believe that we belong to each other as human beings. It's not just about diversity and inclusion. It's about the belonging, the belonging that I felt when I first came to the United States for the person that I was. Nobody asked me to change, nor would I change. So that sense of belonging is what I'm trying to create. And I'm so happy to say we have a space for that. We still have a long way to go, but I'm very grateful to all of you. And I wish you the very best with the convening. Thank you. Have a good day. Okay, thank you everyone. And um, thank you to Almaz for her inspirational story behind the African Diaspora Network and uh, uh, particularly taking with the African Investment Symposium where members lend their mentoring skills, their time, their, their, their training, by their talent, their finance, obviously, which is their treasure to help build Africa's futures through training and financing their entrepreneurs, but also lending those skills back to the diaspora in the home country. So benefiting both countries of origin and uh, countries of, of destination there. Um, great stuff, inspirational stories. Now we're running a little behind time, so I'm gonna hand over straight away to uh, Sanjeev Joshipura of In Diaspora, uh, so he can lend us his experience of the work that he does. Thank you. Thanks, Killian, and uh, thank you to the IOM, and uh, thank you to Kingsley uh, for having me and including me in this wonderful event. Uh, my name is Sanjeev Joshipura, and I'm the Executive Director of In Diaspora. Uh, I'm talking to you today from just outside of Washington, D.C. in America. And let me first tell you just a little bit about in diaspora, who we are and what we do, uh, because that will sort of have a lot of relevance about our focus on diaspora philanthropy. Uh, in diaspora is a nonprofit organization founded in 2012 by a successful investor, entrepreneur, and community builder in San Francisco uh, named M.R. Rangaswamy. And our mission is to inspire and position the global Indian diaspora as a force for good. Now, we are a membership organization, an invitation-only selective membership organization for diaspora leaders, Indian diaspora leaders around the world, in different countries, in different professions of different backgrounds. Uh, and uh, we have uh, there, there are three areas of focus that we work on, which we call our three pillars or our three verticals. 
One of them is uh, nonpartisan political and civic engagement. The other, another, is uh, entrepreneurship and innovation. And the third one that is most germane to today's event is philanthropy and social impact. There are also two themes that we thread through the work in all of our three verticals. First and foremost is in addition to focusing on the very highly accomplished people uh, who are typically our members and who are usually in, as you might imagine, uh, in their 50s and 60s and so forth, and we learn a lot from them, we get a lot of advice from them, which is fantastic. We also focus on the next generation of the diaspora. Because one of the issues of concern that has been raised to us is that the second generation of the diaspora, of the people that have left India, may not quite have the strong ties or connectivity or feeling of belonging as Indian diaspora. So it's important to focus on them early and engage them in what we do. That's one, our focus on the younger folks, in addition to our members who tend to be uh, you know, somewhat, somewhat, uh, somewhat older. And the second theme that uh, sort of cuts through all our verticals is what we call our Global Connect program. And there, we focus extensively on globalizing our work. So not only are we active very much in the United States where we were founded, as you know, and in India, where we now have an office as well. But in addition to that, we are extremely active with the leading Indian diaspora and others, uh, people who may not necessarily be Indian diaspora, but are connected in their work somehow with the Indian diaspora or with India. Uh, we are very active in countries like the UAE, the UK, uh, Canada, and uh, Singapore, and uh, soon starting to make uh, inroads into Australia. Uh, with a future eye on the Caribbean and parts of Africa and other parts of Europe as well, because the Indian diaspora, which is about uh, 30, 32 million people worldwide, is widely spread across several countries, but with a concentration in some countries. And those are the countries we typically would like to focus on first. Now, let me just go back for a second to the three verticals that I mentioned. So in entrepreneurship and innovation, which is one of them, we help facilitate that because we view entrepreneurship and innovation not just as a means of personal wealth creation, which is great, and that's absolutely fantastic, but more importantly, from our perspective, we view it as a means to solving societal problems in some ways, in some cases. There's a lot of social entrepreneurship happening. And under our rubric or mission of being a force for good, we, let, we take the social entrepreneurship lens on the entrepreneurship angle. Uh, on the nonpartisan political and civic engagement. So again, we are not an organization. By, by United States tax law, we are mandated to be an organization that does not actively take political sides uh, on, on, on any side of the political spectrum. Uh, but we do encourage the voice of the Indian community to be heard loud and clear, regardless of their political affiliations, uh, in the political milieu. Uh, and on civic engagement, we are very active in collaborating widely with other communities, uh, such, such as the East Asian community, you know, uh, the Jewish community. These are just some examples. There are many others, the African-American community and et cetera. Um, now, the reason I brought that up is because it segues into the main topic that I want to talk about, which is our philanthropic work. Much of the other things that I just mentioned right now, many of them, uh, has some links into our philanthropic work as well. So I'll just give you some examples of what we've done in philanthropy, and you will see the bleed into the, uh, into the other aspects of what we do. Uh, in philanthropy, there are two views that we take on the subject. One is that many of our members have ties to India, as you might imagine, obviously, and uh, they would like to give back to the country of their origin, which is great. And we actively encourage that and support and facilitate that. And we are a catalyst and a platform that helps them do more of that in a more effective way. And I'll get to that in a second. The other is give where you live. Because the perspective here is that there is no doubt that you might have been born or even raised in India. And uh, you, you know, have uh, strong ties and feelings for your country of origin. 
But in addition to that, that, that alone is not enough. You've also got to look at the country where you've resided, whether it's the United States, whether it's the UK, whether it's you know uh, the UAE, whatever it might be, Singapore, Australia, whatever it might be. The country that you've resided in over the past 20, 30, 40, even 50 years, and where you've made a big name for yourself, where you've enjoyed a lot of success, uh, and where in several cases you have made tremendous amounts of uh, money and uh, you, you've sort of gained a lot of affluence. And it's important also in the effort to position and inspire the Indian diaspora as a force for good to also give in that country, not only towards your home country of origin. Uh, and so that is the view that we take on philanthropy, both give where you live as well as give to India. Now, let me give you a couple of quick examples. And I'm very cognizant, of course, of the of the time here, and we are running a little bit behind. So I will stay to my allocated uh, 10 minutes. And then if there's more that we need to dig into, we can do that in the, in the Q&A. Uh, in terms of giving to India, uh, like I mentioned before, we are a catalyst and a platform. So we are an organization that helps individuals, ultra high net worth individuals, or even the retail uh, charitable giver, the person that gives you know, five or 10 or 15 or $20. We work at all ends of the spectrum, at both ends of the spectrum. We help facilitate their giving to India. And a couple of examples of this are, first and foremost, we are an organization that convened what is known as the IPA, the India Philanthropy Alliance. And the IPA was convened and housed under in diaspora by 20, uh, in 2017. And it is slated to become its own independent spin-off organization over the next two years uh, because it's grown and grown and it's come to a point where uh, it uh, you know, uh, is uh, standing on its own, its own legs, which is a delightful thing for us uh, to watch, having conceived it. Uh, the IPA is an organization that comprises of CEOs of philanthropic organizations of, that, that are focused on India, but are based in the United States. So the CEOs of these organizations are parts of IPA, are members of IPA. And on a monthly basis, since 2017, August, we've been convening these CEOs to talk about various things. We talk about influencing public policy uh, regarding philanthropy in India. We talk about how these organizations can potentially achieve synergies by collaborating in the value chain upstream and downstream. Uh, we talk about how to make sure that their fundraising efforts in the United States uh, and their big events don't clash with each other on the same day or at the same time or in the same location or same city so that each organization has its own space to grow. Uh, so we serve this uh, catalytic function, this, this collaborative convening function. And keep in mind that before, these may seem like obvious things to do, but when there are, you know, tens of large charitable organizations that focus on different things that are based in the U.S. but focusing on India, but different charitable aspects within the work on India, within the philanthropic work on India, these types of collaborations aren't obvious and were not occurring before we convened these, this group, the IPA, in 2017. It's after we started convening them that this kind of collaborative effort, this multiplicative effort, has uh, become evident to all our members. Uh, so, so that is uh, the an example of the IPA. Another example is on on what we call the Chalo Give program. Chalo in the Hindi language means let's go, let's do. Hindi, of course, is one of India's national languages. And so the translation is, let's give. Uh, so in our Chalo Give program, it's a retail online effort to raise money uh, for causes in India and give them to vetted organizations who we know extremely well that work in different areas of the country in different causes. Uh, and uh, over, I, I, I'm happy to say that during COVID, uh, in the last two years, in diaspora, through our Chalo Give program, helped raise more than $5 million, not just for India. Uh, a majority of it, about $3.5 or so, was for India. 
but about a million and a half of that went to America as well, to helping America during COVID. And um, so that is an example of our Chalo Give annual program that we do online. This is for high net worth folks, as well as the retail philanthropic giver. Uh, so that's the giving to India part. Now, let me just end with the give where you live part. One of the initiatives that, and, and, and so by the way, sorry, let me just take a step back and say on the, on the giving to India part, you would have seen the ties with our global connect work. Uh, you would have seen the ties with our diaspora next work where we encourage philanthropists to start out young and give a little bit, flex the giving muscle when you're younger. Even if you can't give millions of dollars, you can give you know maybe tens of dollars, but you get into the giving habit uh, when you're young. Uh, so there are there are overlaps in all of, in all of those work all of those things that we do now on the give where you live side that has uh, sort of a crossover into the political and civic engagement work that we do as well. One of the things that is obvious to anyone, not just in America but in other parts of the world as well, is that the technology revolution, while it has enormous, almost incalculable benefits, has also left some people behind. Uh, and those people that have been left behind need to get the benefits of some sort of reskilling or upskilling to help their career prospects and make their lives better and make the lives of their future generations better. Now, just to narrow it down for now to the example here in America that might apply to uh, certain areas, geographic areas of the country, that might apply to uh, uh, certain uh, you know communities in the country. And so we are at the start of creating a large skilling program involving uh, companies led by Indian diaspora, whether they're based in India or based elsewhere in the world, to involve them and engage them in a reskilling and upskilling effort that is focused on uh, people that the technology revolution has left behind. As you can see, this has immediate crossover into our civic and political engagement work as well. But let me stop here. I know my 10 minutes are up. I do see Killian back on the screen. So let me turn it back to you. Thank you, Sanjeev, for a very interesting uh, background to in diaspora there. I think you make some points that link back to Kingsley's uh, initial uh, intervention on the life cycle of giving and maybe starting that process young with the diaspora, but also to what we heard on the African Diaspora Network. Um, give where you live is the term you use, but you know, philanthropy isn't just only about countries of, of origin, but also countries of residence too. Um, so, so common links and common threads between uh, various interventions there. Now, I want to introduce this next section. It's going to be an interactive discussion and I invite everyone uh, to either uh, share your comments or particularly your, your questions through the chat function. Or indeed, if you want to make an intervention, please raise your hand and we shall do so uh, and we shall take you on board. Now, what we have here, what I want to do is share some guiding questions uh, from a the uh, from 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 the background paper to this particular session, and now if I the technology will let me work, I'll put these onto the uh, onto the uh, screen here. But there are three guiding questions, and hopefully you can see them. Uh, I will read them out if you can't see them. Um, so first question: What could you recommend at a policy level to leverage diaspora philanthropy? And I think Sanji talked about policy there, so I might give that one to him initially. Second question, what could you recommend in terms of programs to enable leverage diaspora, enable, sorry, and leverage diaspora philanthropy? And the third and last question, who are the key actors to partner with, uh, with governments to enable and leverage diaspora philanthropy? Um, so in the absence maybe of any questions coming in uh, at the moment, maybe I'll give that last question to Kingsley, if you don't mind. You know, we talk about the stakeholders that are important uh, within philanthropic, diaspora philanthropic giving. Um, from your perspective and from your experience, Kingsley, who might you say are the key stakeholders and, and key actors in that regard? Kings, are you there? Sorry, Killian. Killian. Thank you for Thank that. You for um, that. Um, it's a great it's question. question. And I think I it think begs a uh, further question. So, you, Kings, you, your sound is uh, not. Can you hear me now, okay? 
Can you hear me now? Okay, Kevin. Um, it's echoing a little bit, uh, Kingsley. Yeah, can you hear me now? Okay. Now we can hear you absolutely. That's right, perfect. Right. Yeah, look, I think it's a great question, and I think it begs a bigger question, which is, you know, what's the role of government when it comes to diaspora philanthropy? You know, as you said in your definition at the very beginning, uh, philanthropy is <clears throat> private, private wealth for public good. So, what's the role of government? And I think the role of government is to be probably to be a facilitator rather than implementer. It's always that debate between the role of government. But I think governments can create the enabling conditions. Government can be supportive. Governments can actually help uh, to a certain extent to teach and train in this area. I mean, I think all diaspora organizations, because so many of them are private organizations, their number one ob <clears throat> objective to survive is a is actually to raise money philanthropically, not just for their causes and cases, but also just to keep themselves alive and to keep their organizations going. So I think government plays an important role as, as and creates those enabling conditions, creates the environment, does some maybe some pump priming in a small kind of financial way. As you know, the Irish government have a an arrogant support program where they support diaspora organizations outside of Ireland around the world. I think stuff like that can be great and it can be a sort of a pump priming uh, kind of role rather than being a full on implementer. Because there's always a little bit of kind of concern sometimes about government being too involved in these areas. Um, and I think that that's getting that balance right is fundamental to trying to get this thing to work. And, and what about the role maybe for the private sector in this? Uh, I know Ireland has been relatively successful in tapping up its diaspora uh, uh, to encourage FDI into 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 Ireland, at least in the past. And I'm just curious, are there any any learnings from your perspective as to what other countries could do? Well, I think, you know, what we have is an interesting subset of FDI, Foreign Direct Investment, which we sometimes call DDI, Diaspora Direct Investment. And the diaspora can play an interesting role when it comes to that, not just necessarily in themselves investing, but actually being, we used to call them tipping agents, people who are in a position to nudge a deal or nudge something in Ireland's direction and could be for any country. And it can be as simple as making an introduction or, you know, giving a piece of advice, giving a bit of suggestion, passing on some gossip, whatever it is. That all is part of the, the fabric of what makes these decisions uh, so critical. And it, it can be the... It can be the tipping point. It can be the, the small little piece of information that tips a deal in a country's direction. So I think that, you know, having those, you know, we used to call them business rock stars, people in the right position in right companies around the world. No, and back to the old question of who are they, where are they, what are they doing, knowing who they are, and uh, then building those long-term hearts and minds relationships with them. It's really quite simple, but quite hard to do well. Yeah, and I guess it it, it takes time as well, is one thing is to uh, bear in mind. Um, Sanjeev, if I may just come back to you then on the question that we have at the top here, um, at policy level, from your experience engaging in, in public policy and trying to engage, get the Indian diaspora to engage in public policy, um, what would you recommend at a policy level from that experience to leverage uh, uh, diaspora philanthropy? Yeah, you know, I, I would like to sort of uh, take off where Kingsley left off. Uh, I think Kingsley makes a very good point when he started out by saying that the, uh, the, that, that government should not sort of act as a doer, but rather more as a facilitator and more as an, a, a group or institution that encourages philanthropy rather than gets actively involved in sort of directing it or executing it, right? Uh, I, I, I couldn't agree with that more. But I think that can be taken one step further, which is to say that there are various instances and occasions, and they differ in different countries, where government sometimes, for various reasons, reasons that for you know, uh, you know, multiple thought processes and cultural attributes that are germane to that particular country that they view as entirely legitimate, they actually discourage diaspora philanthropy, right? And that is something that I think is a function of trust. It goes back to the uh, topic of our session. It goes back to what Kingsley said at the very start of the session. He talked about trust and building trust. Uh, I think that once that trust is built between philanthropic actors and governments of the country towards which they are directing their philanthropy, 
uh, a lot more can be done. And depending on what country we are talking about, they are in various stages of that evolutionary life cycle. For example, here in the United States, uh, philanthropy is made much easier. I know the same is true in, uh, let's say, the UAE for the most part. Uh, I know the same is true for the most part, again, in the, in the UK, in, in, in Canada, and so forth. Uh, there are certain other countries, which I'm aware of, where it is actually very difficult for an organization like ours to get actively engaged in uh, uh, philanthropic causes or even facilitating philanthropic causes uh, in, that, in that nation. So, uh, you know, I, I, I just guess it depends on, it depends from country to country and influencing that agenda, I think is important for the diaspora. Uh, thank you. Sanjeev. And, and again, if anyone from the audience wants to uh, participate, ask a question in the chat function or indeed raise your hand and intervene. Um, we're more than happy to uh, hear from you on that one. Um, so perhaps there's a, there's a third question, which is the middle question, number two, I, really, I guess, is um, on terms of the programs that we could uh, develop to enable and leverage the ASPRA philanthropy. Um, Sanji, maybe back to you on that one. If if governments are to be the facilitator here, not necessarily the doer or executor, um, do you see multiple stakeholder programs as the answer here or as a solution here? And and what's the different role for the different actors in, in terms of how you would see that leveraging uh, the asper of philanthropy? Just building on what you just said previously. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that, that also is a very good question. I think you've addressed uh, three good questions here, Killian. Um, you know, I think that in terms of the programmatic aspect of things, uh, there are two sides to it, in my view. One is that, so here I'll take the example of, of India, right? Uh, I am finding more and more over the past, I'd say about at least five, six years, that India has become, at a governmental level, more sophisticated about the kinds of philanthropic interventions that are needed in the country, but that government cannot provide, right? Uh, and does not wish to provide or is unable to provide for a whole host of reasons. Uh, and making sure that they have a sense of those priorities, what those priorities are, and they could be different in different parts of the country, as you might imagine. India is just one example, but this could apply to several other countries. Countries tend to be very complex in terms of their geography, in terms of different parts of the country, thinking differently about certain things, needing different things. And so whether that priority list is made at the central government or federal government level, or more often, and perhaps more effectively, whether it's made at a level below at the state government level, uh, where they are closer to the ground, to have that those priority lists and to have that attitude of you know collaboration and inviting partnerships uh, for programmatic interventions is important. That's on the governmental side, right? Now let me change the lens to the uh, the doer side, the organizations that will actually provide uh, the philanthropic interventions. Uh, so these, for example, would be members of in in in, in my instance, members of the IPA, right? Uh, for those organizations too, it is very important to make sure that they are prepared to come in as a group if needed to those various countries or states or provinces within countries where they can look at the philanthropic needs in a holistic manner and think about collaboration upstream and downstream in the value chain. For example, I'll just make this very practical. Um, there are organizations that provide meals to hungry children, which is great, which is fantastic. Obviously, such a huge, huge need. Uh, then there are organizations that cater to another very important need, which is build schools for children in underprivileged areas uh, so that children can attend schools, make sure the schools are well-staffed, make sure they have the equipment, all of that. Again, a, a prime need, right? And wouldn't, wouldn't it be great if when a state government or a central government or federal government in whatever country identifies childhood hunger or childhood malnutrition as one of their problems and identifies uh, pre-primary education as another problem 
if the philanthropic organizations in a grouping like the IPA were able to say, all right, I'm able to work on this part of it. You are able to work on that part of it. Let's go in together. Let's collaborate. Let's be ready to meet with these government officials together. Let's tour the facilities on the ground together. And let's see what we can do as a group to solve the problem holistically. So I think it's important for the organizations that provide the philanthropic services also to be similarly you know, well-organized and prioritized in both parts. Yeah, I mean, that, that's an important point. So did you want to come in there, Kingsley, at all? Yeah, I'm just going to pick up on some of the things Sanjeev was saying there, because I, I agree with all of that. And, you know, when, when Chuck Feeney, the story I told, when he came to Ireland, he very often sat down with government and said, well, look, I'm willing to put up 100 million for this particular project or 10 million, but we need you and government to match that. So it was a, there was kind of a matching sense. And then there's that wonderful Tres Peruno scheme with between uh, the United States hometown associations in Mexico, where if somebody puts up uh, $50 and the state government, state and federal um, situation in Mexico, it ends up being three for one. So there's a sort of an interesting kind of relationship there. But when I think back to looking at, you know, there's so many tens of thousands of diaspora organizations around the world. And in many ways, it's let a thousand flowers bloom, let let everybody, you know, bloom and see what happens. And you know what, some will fail, and some will be very successful. <clears throat> and when I look back on, on look at organizations that we engaged in, what makes them really successful as diaspora philanthropy organizations? And I think that you need three things. The first thing, you need a great case. You know, why do you exist? What are you trying to do? That's really important. But the cases are overall pretty strong. The second thing you need is a constituency. It's got to be a group of people who care about what you're doing. And that goes back to the big question of the morning. Who are they? Where are they? What are they doing? And then the third thing, when I actually think this is probably the single most important thing, is leadership. And now leadership is a fascinating thing. When you know, Sanjeev told the story of how his organization started, but it started with an inspiring individual with an idea. And, and he attracted other people around him. And the organization I worked for, the Ireland Funds, again, it was a couple of inspiring individuals, a guy called Tony O'Reilly, who was the head of the Heinz Food Company, and uh, Dan Rooney, uh, who was of Irish diaspora extraction, owned the Pittsburgh Steelers. They had an idea. But I think it's that leadership thing which is so important. So I think governments can play a role and can play a role in capacity building for organizations, but also identifying and working with people who have leadership potential. I think that's why when Sanji talked about the next generation, that's so, so important because um, – very often, it's the parents of those kids that we're involving at a, at a younger level are delighted, are really delighted that their kids are getting engaged back in their country of heritage. They may, may not have been born there. Um, and so it's a double whammy in many ways. It works really, really well. And there's real examples of that. Yeah, and I'm just wondering then, is there a follow-up question um, or point to be made? Does the level of engagement from a diaspora community, does it kind of weaken a little bit as you go down the generations? Mm -hmm. Obviously, um, you know, as, as diaspora ourselves, at least myself, very close connection with my home country, but maybe my kids will have half of that connection and their kids, you know, a quarter of that. So how, how what's your experience of that um, uh, diaspora engagement through the generations? And what can be done to, to maintain it? Or do we even need to try and maintain it or facilitate it or to encourage it um, amongst those that generation level who didn't necessarily originate or come and make, emigrate themselves from that country? Well, Ingrid, you want to go first? I'll go quick because I know you'll have a lot to say about this. I find, <laughs> I find it extraordinary. Sometimes the most passionate people uh, I was engaged with, with Ireland are people whose great 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 grandparents came from Ireland. You know, and in a funny sort of way, it's part of their new identity or their identity in whatever country that they're living in. So I find that it doesn't always automatically mean because there's a couple of generations adrift that in some way their interest and desire um, is reduced. And also technology and communications mean that, you know, we now can be here and there. In the old days, your geography dictated your identity. If you lived in, with Sanjeev in San Francisco, that's who you were. You're a Californian. But now you can live a hyphenated life. You can be completely Californian, but very engaged back in Poland or Scotland. Um, and I think that's kind of a fascinating dimension that's out there. And the other thing, and I haven't really expressed this enough, I think, I don't think there is a, such a thing as an Indian diaspora, an Irish diaspora. There's hundreds of them. 
and they're different and they have different needs and desires and they didn't like each other when they lived back in India or Ireland. Why should they like each other now? <laughs> so I think that we need to be understanding that it's not one homogenous block. I mean, India is made up all sorts of provinces and, and areas with different interests and desires. And you need to be able to you know, satisfy their needs and desires rather than just try to put a blanket definition on them. I think they tend to reject that. So diasporas are often not about a country, but about a place. And very often it's a town, a village. I'm just doing some work with the Basque community and then just purely with the Basque community. I did work a few years ago with just the city of Copenhagen. And Sanjeev, I'm sure you've found that, that it's not about one big homogenous blob. Yes, I think you're exactly right, Kingsley. I have found that out too. Uh, as, as you talk about how different India is, you know, uh, India has uh, different states which all have different cuisines and different cultures, different languages. And by all accounts, they probably could have been, maybe even should have been, uh, you know, different, different, different countries in, in their own right. But it's a miracle of history, I think, and a pleasant miracle of history that India is, is very much one country with all these different states. So, yes, the Indian diaspora are different depending on where they come from. They're also different depending on where they go to. For example, the Indian diaspora in Dublin wouldn't be the same as the Indian diaspora in Detroit. Uh, their needs are different and they want to do different things. So you're exactly right. Uh, but going back to uh, Killian's question about the next generation, you know, I do think that over time, so I, I have found in my experience that when I look at the other diasporas here in the United States, when I look at the Chinese diaspora, when I look at the Israeli diaspora, for example, depending on which country you're from, over time, your interests and your ties with your country of origin or your parents' or grandparents' country of origin changes and differs. The Israelis have a different sort of, uh, you know, linkage over time. The Israeli diaspora in America have different linkages over time with Israel than do, say, the Irish, than do the Germans, than do the Chinese, than do the Indians. You know, so it's a very complex question there. But I do think that over time, generally speaking, especially when one goes out three, four generations, links to your home country do tend to weaken a little bit. Uh, I think there's two things that are important to do here. One is, I think it's important to make sure that some, uh, you know, even if you're talking four generations down, that some tenuous links are maintained because it helps globalize the mind, helps make one a better global citizen, even if one is a fourth generation or fifth generation Indian in you know, San Francisco or Washington, D.C., to know a little bit about the thought processes and the culture that is influencing her or him today that might have been passed down from five generations ago. It's helpful to know that. That may make them a better, you know, more productive, more effective person in what they are doing today. Uh, right? That's one. So it's important that in diaspora, I think, continues to engage people in sort of, of, of a younger generation as we are doing in our diaspora next program, knowing fully well that over time that engagement might weaken. That's one. But the other thing is I think you then change the focus. You change the focus about making it the soft power of the Indian diaspora as a whole and don't talk necessarily about the fifth generation's links to India, but rather talk about give where you live. Make it Make it be where the fifth generation Indians in Ireland or the UK or Singapore are fantastic philanthropic givers in Ireland or the UK or Singapore. And wouldn't that be a wonderful thing for the soft power of the entire community? And Sanjeev, I think there's such a thing as global Indianness, which I think is an interesting and this, I think Modi really got on, on top of that when he went off to Madison Square Garden and Melbourne Cricket Ground and Wembley Stadium. And I think that this difference between the state and the nation is very interesting. The nation, you know, the state is just lines on a map, but the nation is a global, <laughs> is a global yeah. notion. Yeah. You know, like we would say in Ireland that we have an empire, but it was not built by military might or force of arms. We haven't won a home match since we beat the Danes in 1014. You know, we haven't had a great history of conquering countries, but we have a massive empire of influence. And I think Absolutely. that your issue of soft power is fascinating. Yeah, and I think that speaks to, that soft power speaks to the power of, of diplomatic diplomacy in, in some respects. Um, we've had a comment here on the on the chat from uh, Delali uh, Badasu. Thank you, Delali. Um, the comment is, governments and philanthropists can consider how to involve recipients in the campaign 
to raise resources with a principle of giving back to show appreciation. It's not to take back from them, I guess, the diaspora, they, but the opportunity uh, to be involved. And I guess maybe that speaks to your earlier presentation, Kingsley, on the nature of, of giving and the, and the nature of engagement as well with philanthropy. It's important, as important to be involved after the act of philanthropy, as you like, as, as much as it is, is beforehand. Um, is it, do you want to expand a little bit on that? I know you only had a short time earlier on, but uh, how, how can governments are, oh, let's see, what's the role then maybe for government once the act of philanthropy has been, has been uh, executed, if you like, what's the role for engagement afterwards and how can, how can we do that better? Yeah, I, I found a very interesting thing. I'd be very incentive in your comments on this. I found that philanthropy was a portal through which people entered into a relationship with their home country and then opened up the possibility of engaging on multiple levels. In other words, you know, a philanthropic gift, perhaps a scholarship or a pay medical something, cancer or something like that, uh, and you get these people engaged, you get to know them. And then you realize that they've got business interests, they've got cultural interests, they've got sporting interests, they've got cultural interests. And you can actually begin to develop a relationship in a, on a multiplicity of levels with these people, which is really fascinating. And, and you kind of really get them fired up about this kind of uh, relationship. I think the glue in all of this is, I think, and I think Sanjeev mentioned, it was a sense of belonging. So we talk a lot about diversity and inclusion, but I think if, if you listen to what people are saying now, it's diversity, inclusion, and belonging. They call it dibs. And I think it's a, it's a fascinating concept, is this notion now that people can belong. You see, people can read the daily newspapers instantaneously. People get information is just as quickly as I get it here in Dublin. They get it in Melbourne or Los Angeles. So I think that this is, it's redefining that kind of state versus nation definitions, which I just mentioned, which is so fascinating. Sanjeev, what do you think? Yes, Kingsley, thank you uh, for that segue. I do agree entirely with you. I have seen that myself, where philanthropic donors get involved with their country of origin, for example, uh, and with the governments there. And then that leads to further involvement in different areas, be it healthcare technology, be it the educational sector, or what have you. So, uh, and using philanthropy as the tip of the spear, if you will, uh, as the gateway through which one enters the relationship and then further builds on it, is, uh, is a concept that I have seen occur. The one thing that I would like to add to that is that I have also seen the reverse. And I'm sure Kingsley has as well, given his tremendous and long experience in uh, uh, diaspora matters all over the world. Uh, I, and, and, and this, by the way, is a reason that I think Philanthropic organizations need to be very clued in to what is going on in the business and financial world. What I've seen is that oftentimes, at least in the Indian diaspora, I've noticed this, you know, uh, ad nauseum, quite frankly, is that initially the relationship begins with a commercial transaction, an entrepreneurial venture, a financial investment, uh, uh, a venture capital bet. Uh, you know, a, a cross-border M&A or collaboration. Uh, and then that over time leads to a better understanding from the diaspora who is doing that investment about the issues that face that particular location or that, that sector or that country in which he or she is invested. And, and then that also engages. Here, and I'm just wondering if we can, yeah. we only have a few minutes left. Yeah. I'm yeah. wondering if we can just involve some members of the audience here. Sure. Um, sure. Nuatam uh, Papka from Nigeria, do, do you want to uh, uh, speak or ask a question? I see you have your hands raised. Yes, I just wanted to make a comment, a quick comment. I agree with the previous speakers that um, government should play the facilita facilitator role for um, diaspora and philanthropic engagement. I think that governments can provide credible platforms where these conversations can begin. Um, in Nigeria, we have established an annual diaspora investment summit to provide a platform for diaspora invest investors to interact with potential partners, sponsors, financiers, regulatory officials. I believe that a similar platform could also be created to enhance um, um, engagement on diaspora um, philanthropy. That's just what I wanted to add. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nevman. I think that speaks to, to what the um, guys are saying earlier. Well, I see Paddy Knudsen has uh, from Zambia. Paddy, did you want to um, intervene? Gillian, thank you. Uh, and also to Sanjeev and, and Kingsley on sharing your reflections. I just wanted to come in, you know, talking about one of the long term, one of the important ingredients, I think, in diaspora engagement, in addition to, you know, the wealth of information that's being shared here and in the chat. And I think for me, what really stands out is the long termism. Uh, and I think that when 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 governments uh, or even, let's say, local organizations that are in the home countries engage with diaspora. It's sort of important to, to leverage on this part that diaspora are in there for the long term. Diaspora would not be like a development agency. It would not be like a di you know an FDI. They're there for the long term. Uh, they're there for the long term because they are deeply rooted relationships, connections, identities, and many other aspects that go, um, that go to their engagement in, in home countries. But also the same thing, I think, would happen for those diaspora that that have established home in the destination countries. And I think that's what, you know, Sanjeev is talking about, you know, the action to where you are. So I think that long-termism is very important. And I think that really changes how government would then engage with diaspora. We're not just coming in to get diaspora bonds. We're just not coming in to ask for, you know, moving into an area of green investment. We're also not just coming in to deal with crisis, a humanitarian crisis, but we're coming in for the long-term. So really being given that active seat as a development actor and as a development partner. And I think we see that very evident from kind of individual agency, you know, when diaspora have individual agency, um, all the way to something that's more organized or structured uh, at, at that very global level. And then the last thing uh, I just wanted to chime in, um, Killian here, I think is the point that you raised on, on, on generational uh, engagement. Um, I am in the diaspora, I'm based here in Kosovo, uh, and I've had siblings that have lived in the UK. 10 years, my young sister, who's 10 years younger than me, has a totally different relationship to my country Zambia than I have. I've struggled a lot the fact that I haven't been able to go home um, and I think she struggles less and she would definitely be suffocating if I had her here in Pristina and not have connection to London. So I think uh, all of that comes back to uh, her engagement and I, I often give this example from two sisters her engagement is very much based on how I engage, how my mother engages who's also uh, in the diaspora and how others around her engage. So I think having a very targeted and intentional diaspora strategy with this new generation will be very critical. Otherwise, I think we stand the chance to just lose out uh, in terms of the the, destin the the home countries themselves. Thanks again uh, for this platform. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. That's a great intervention there. And, you know, I guess the diaspora experience differs from person to person from all of us. Um, one more intervention here. I have someone called Timur if we need to, do you want to have a very brief introduction? Uh, sorry, in, uh, intervention, and um, thereafter we'll wrap up the session. Timur, oh, the floor is yours. Timur, you're on mute. Never mind. Okay, so. Guys, we've more or less run out of time anyway. I think we've had a really uh, a great session. I'm great to hear from uh, the audience at the end. Uh, we have a hard stop at 12. I've just been notified. Um, so just to kind of wrap things up here, we, we've talked today uh, about the importance of diaspora philanthropy. We talked about the life cycle of giving. We've talked about the role of government as well and that more of a facilitator, less perhaps as, a, as, a, as an executor. Um, and it's it role as facilitator, as a partner, as a stakeholder to work with uh, diaspora organizations to encourage diaspora philanthropy. Um, I think some of the important things as well that we've heard uh, both from Sanji and from Almaz is on the, the nature of philanthropy itself. You know, it's give where you live. It's philanthropy, not just countries of, of, of origin, but also countries of residence and or destination and the importance of that as well. And I think we had a really uh, crucial intervention from, from Paddy at the end, talking about the importance of long-termism that, you know, engagement philanthropy shouldn't just follow election cycles. And he needs a vision, he needs long-term thinking. Um, so with that in mind, thank you all. I want us to hang over, hand over to Kingsley as session host for his closing reflections in two minutes, please, Kingsley. Thank you. Oh, well, I, I, didn't, I didn't anticipate that, but I, one of the points I was going to make is that, you know, what's wonderful about your session, Killian, and listening to Sanjeev and listening to Paddy and others, 
um, is that this is a non-competitive industry. When you think about it, you know, somebody who's going to give money to Finland or Peru or Poland or India, you know, is not going to give money to Sweden or Swaziland. So, so we should collaborate, cooperate and, 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 and contribute to each other as much as possible. I'm a, I'm a founder member of an organization called CASE, which stands for Copy and Steal Everything. So figure, <laughs> figure out who's doing this really, really well and will it work in my country? You know, so, you know, let you look at a program like Taglis in, uh, in, in Israel where they bring young people back. And I think this has been a very powerful motivator to engage young people around the diaspora. Um, and, you know, hundreds of thousands have gone on this program. Any country, anywhere can do a program like Taglis. We had another program in Ireland some years ago called The Gathering, where we actually invited the diaspora to come back in one particular year. And hundreds of thousands came back. 5,000 events were held. Any country can do a gathering. In fact, Scotland did one. In fact, Scotland did it first, and we copied Scotland uh, back to case, copy and steal everything. So I think that that's the fascinating thing about fora like today, discussions and listening. I love listening to the Sanjis of this world because I'm going to go away with some ideas. Um, hearing Paddy's contribution was fantastic, so articulate and so brilliant. So I think that you know we have so much to learn, Gillian. Um, just go away, figure out what bits work and figure out what bits don't work. Because, you know, I actually have a paper I wrote, 25 yeah, reasons why the national have failed, and it sometimes do. <laughs> have some competition here. <laughs> so back thank to you, you guys. Yeah, let's, we have to wrap up there. It's a hard stop at 12. Sanjeev, thank you to you as well. The feedbacks and comments and the insights from today will all feed back into the outcome document for the summit. And we hope to see a lot on philanthropy, uh, diaspora philanthropy in there. So once again, thank you for everyone. And we'll see you at the forthcoming sessions this afternoon. Thank you, Killian Kingsley. And thanks to the audience. Thanks, guys. Enjoy the session. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.